true. Because yeah. I'll tell you, like 99% of people do not say, yeah, I believe that he was alive, right. the greatest life ever existed. Right, right. My default. Yeah, I mean, and I think regardless of their spiritual background too, right, which is one of the things very that's true. very powerful in the element of the good news is like that's not never been a negotiable conversation really. Like everyone kind of agrees, like he was an amazing human. And like, there's nothing about that that I can deny. And so it's really good. I'm curious because I, as I said, I could geek out on this side. I could geek out on the business. I love all of it in the middle. Um, I want to know your evolution into this world of entrepreneurship and business. And where did that start? And how um, soon did you realize the need of, of really bringing in your spirituality into the place of the secular marketplace? Yeah. Um, so after I got out of ministry, I became a brand manager for one of my friend's companies. <laughs> nice. I had to like build a relationship to get into business because I really struggled to like contextualize the two sure. and merge them. Um, but I figured out very quickly my competency was understanding human behavior. Yeah. And part of understanding human behavior is it kind of wraps up like Tony Robbins' six human needs. And I never figured this out till way later yeah. in life. But, um, you know, it's focused on certainty and uncertainty and significance and going all the way to the spiritual contribution parts, which is like growth and contribution. And so when you get in those spiritual elements, they're a little bit different than the ones that we need as people. But I just, you know, my dad was in ministry for, he still is. I mean, it's been like 35, 40 years. So I've just seen human beings interact and I know what they put on prayer cards and I've read those and I've seen the challenges. I was leading people through divorce when I was 23 and my parents weren't even divorced because I just could navigate them through the energy of challenges and, and just help them supported of course by like really amazing people but like it's just always been a part of my life to understand like what is it on a foundational basis that people want and i've just always been in the ethical way like aligned to like i'm not going to give people something that's not good for them yeah and so i do the hard work of knowing and getting beneath the surface of things to like figure out what would truly be best whether that's positioning their product or inviting someone and enrolling them into an experience that i know will change their life yeah. Um, so I just kind of, I don't know, I leave it with open hands, but the way that I got into entrepreneurship very specifically was accidentally, um, I made a company $5 million in nine months and I was still making a salary and I was like, this doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> like, wait a second. <laughs> that, that doesn't equate. And when I asked for more responsibility, they're like, yeah, well, you know what? We'll have you do our email marketing. And I was like, y'all don't get it. Like yeah. this is, I'm so in the future of where y'all are at. So I left and went to fortune 500 and did that. And I found myself at a boardroom table with a CEO of a $4 billion company. And I had just left ministry 18 months prior. So I just knew that God had a certain amount of favor on my life. And no matter, there was an element of the Midas touch. I felt like David talks about this too. No matter what he did, like it just worked yeah. until it didn't. Um, yeah. And it felt that way for a while. Um, and, you know, and then I just kind of, I figured out that entrepreneurship was I think the greatest path of spiritual evolution that I could use and I could leverage in order to just become the best version of myself. I very much had that idea that I don't want to get to the finish line and meet the version of me that went all out and, you know, overcame the things I need to overcome and and lived every day to its fullest and go like, man, we didn't end up in the same place. And so it's my desire and my pursuit every day to, to stay on that path. And of course, some days are easier than others. And you know, you get life's challenges and curveballs, but that's what keeps me anchored to the future of, of uh, you know, of where I know that God can lead me. And in addition, it's all about our becoming. I'm not someone who's here to do a lot. I'm here to be someone who sees a lot. And I've had prophetic gifting spoken over my life since I was a little kid. I remember a lady came into my house and she's kind of like one of those wild, like ladies at, you know, AG church, right? Yeah. The flags and the whole thing, you know, and the anointing oil she Pull, pour a whole canister on my head. <laughs> but she's, she like was in my room and she painted the word prophet on my room oh, wow. when we were, um, we built a new house. My parents did. And so we had like a painting party. Sure, sure. And so she did that. And I remember that. I remember that vividly walking into that room going like, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Until I looked it up and I looked up my name and what it meant. And I looked up my last name and it means cave dweller. Wow. And prophets typically hid in the caves when they were on the run where they'd give yeah. a word of caution. Yeah. They hated them for it. So I started seeing all of those different things in my life, all those staples in my life. And it was never an option for me to not carry spirituality into business because it's part of my being. I'm a spiritual being first, you know, and I think that's a really important concept. The additional piece on the second half of that is I want to be a spiritual billionaire. I don't care if I am in the natural world because that's not where I'm going to be long term. But I look at that in the sense of like, 
how can I do like my best to inspect my own life and to be focused on the transformation that I'm bringing to everyday people through conversation, through encouragement. I think that's like the whole acorn effect is like encouraging people, you know, yeah. paying it forward, you know, um, and I just, I don't know. I just, I see the world upside down and backwards in that way. And then I'm also really good at making a lot of money. So then there's that thing. But I think that's just a byproduct of doing what I love well by uniquely being who God called me to be and not judging any of that. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I've heard you say on one of the shows that like the way that you've been able to support so many and is, and get them through the place of not judging themselves. And I totally. think self-judgment, self-criticism, the thing that keeps us, even our voices in, in trapped in that place of mental and physical misalignment is, is the stagnation of becoming. Like we're almost afraid, whether in entrepreneurship you hear all the time, like, I'm afraid of success. What happens if this does happen? Versus a lot of people who are anti-entrepreneurship and they're like, I'm afraid of failure, so I'll just go to this job nine to five. Not to say everybody's like that. I know that's not that's very much stereotypical. But in that conversation with people, helping them not judge themselves, what are ways that they can do that? By not judging others is the number one thing. Yeah. It's, it always comes down to the trading of those virtues and, and vices, right? The vices are the criticism, comparison, and judgment. Mm. And so I already know right away, if someone is judging someone else, they will judge themselves 10 times harder. 